Hey everybody, Ryan Dorn here from Brainswell Media and 360 Ad Sales. Welcome to another informative Schwecky Booster webinar. Thanks for being here. Today we're going to talk about great SEO and what I believe Google wants. Obviously, I don't work for Google. That'd be a cool job uh, to have. I've seen some funny movies uh, about it. But I do have an opportunity to work with publishers, large and small, and really work them through their SEO plans for success. So I've had the opportunity to work with, gosh, almost 3,000 websites in my career. And the things I'm going to share with you today I know work really well and will definitely not tilt the Google pinball machine of success. Now, what do I mean by that? Some of you on this webinar today are actually old enough to remember playing pinball machines. And when you rock those pinball machines, it actually alerts a tilt meter and you're going to lose your turn. And that's not what we want. Google is not a criminal organization. Google is there to help you be successful in your business. And I truly believe that Google wants you to be a success. But I can tell you one thing that I really believe deep down in my heart, and that is this. When you stop trying to beat Google to get ranking and results, that's when you're going to start seeing great ranking and results. What do I mean by that? All too often, we focus on beating the Google bot rather than feeding the Google bot. I have heard time and time again from people like Matt Cutts and others within the, the Google enterprise, the Google industry, that if you create a great website and you do it in an ethical way and you have your reader's best interest in mind, then you're going to see some really great Google SEO success. So why does Google make all these changes? Well, because they want to have the best results possible. They want to fight spammers. They want to give you the best from what they scan. Are all these changes? Are the changes good? I think the changes are good. Google makes 300 to 3,000 changes a year. Who knows how many? I think every change they make is an effort to make the rankings better within their search engine. Matt Cutts has said many times, build a great website. And that's where rankings come from, and I believe it. Remember something, Google and the search results are based upon the Googlebot. Now, I would tell you this, I think the Googlebot does make some bad assumptions, but I can't blame the Googlebot because it's a robot. What you feed it is critical as a media company. Understand it's a lot of ones and zeros. And so if we feed the Googlebot correctly and we guide the Googlebot correctly, that's when we start seeing some really great results. All right, today we're going to talk about 10 things of what I believe, and this is my opinion, of what I believe Google and the Google bot really like. Number one, they love keyword rich articles. Number two, they love articles that are very specific. Number three, they love videos and photos that back up your great articles. Number four, they like it when people link to you. Number five, they love it when people share, when you, when people share about you on Twitter and, and Facebook and Google+. Plus. Number six, the Googlebot loves it when you tell him where to look, okay? Number seven, they love it when your articles are obvious and are keyword dense. Within reason, we'll talk about that. They love it when you use proper HTML tagging to accentuate the article. Block quotes, bold, things like that. They love it. The Googlebot loves it when your titles and your headlines make sense. Because remember, it's a robot, so it doesn't do jokes or clever or, or pith, okay? And then last but not least, I love to use bold. Now, I don't go crazy with bold, but I love to use bold to accentuate what's important within that article. Let's go through these 10 things in some more detail. Number one, keyword rich articles. What does that mean? As an example, here's a headline, kids unite around great treat. And the body of the, 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 body of the story might be kids love cookies. Do you know one that does not? Each day, hundreds of kids match this age old treat with milk. So there's the headline, and then there's the body of the story. Obviously, this is just a sample. So what is this article about? So in a learning environment here, pretend that you're a robot. What is this article about? It's about kids what? Eating cookies. The interesting thing is when you look at this article, the headline doesn't mention cookies, and the body of the email mentions cookies only one time. So if you're a robot and you're reading this headline, this story could be about kids, it could be about unity, it could be around treats. If you read the body of the story, it could be about kids, love, cookies. 
It could be about uh, milk. It could be about treats. So even though this is stylistically written well, meaning that a journalist might look at this and say, oh, wow, that's written very well and it's compelling. The interesting thing is, quite honestly, I don't believe that Google and the Google bot would actually know how to classify this. So a better way to look at it might be something like this. Maybe you write the headline to say kids unite around cookies, since it's an article about kids and, and cookies. The body of this story might be something like kids love cookies. Do you know one that does not? Each day, hundreds of kids eat milk and cookies. So now we've got three occurrences of cookies and we've got several occurrences of kids. So clearly, this article on your website is about kids and cookies. So I hope that that example makes sense in terms of how you can write so that the Google bot would actually understand what the article is about. Now, the interesting piece is, if you look at the differences between this article as it was originally written, and then the article that I wrote, keeping in mind that Google is a robot, quite honestly, there's not a lot of difference in the terms of how it's perceived by your reader. There is a tremendous amount of difference, though, in terms of how it's perceived by the Google bot. So give it some consideration as you're writing your articles. All right, now let's take a look, for example, at bostonherald.com. All right, so you'll notice on here that the, this is about uh, the World Series, and you'll see ALCS Game 3 Live, Strong Start for Verlander. Now, the interesting piece is a user going to Google is probably going to be searching for titles or things like Boston Red Sox or World Series or, or things like that. So if we actually look at the body of the article here that's in front of you, you'll notice that World Series isn't mentioned. And quite honestly, the Boston Red Sox are, are actually not mentioned. The Detroit Tigers are actually not mentioned. And so the interesting piece of that is, is when we actually go and we look at Google as an example and actually type in what an average person would type in, which might be Red Sox score as an example, you're going to notice that the Boston Herald does not actually pop up in any of the top rankings on the Google search. Let's go back to the story. So what we assume that people are going to search for might be Red Sox as an example. Well, looking at this story, a Red Sox score or World Series scores, you'll notice that this particular article, okay, and I'm not meaning to be mean to the author, I'm just trying to prove a point. If you look at this article, you'll notice that Red Sox and score are only mentioned one time in this article. Now, keep in mind, guys, there's a lot of exceptions to uh, every single rule. But the Boston Herald, when we actually go and we look at the Google results, we actually searched for Red Sox score. If you go and look through here, they're not even seen in the first top 10 listings on Google. So what that tells us is this, that we are on the correct path in trying to advise you that keyword density is important. Because if we dug deeper and looked at the Bleacher Report, or ESPN, or sports.yahoo.com, or any of those, you're going to notice that they've paid attention to the keywords that people might potentially search for. And that's why it affects dramatically their ranking within the Google search. Number two, Google really likes it when your articles are specific because they, Google, wants to provide you specific results. So in my opinion, what I want to share with you is four or five examples. You want to be specific not generic. So as an example, Walmart is very, very generic. Do you notice that Walmart very rarely pops up in the top 10 searches within the Google index? Why is that? It's because they're not specific to anything. So in my opinion, the more specific you are, the better you're going to be ranked. In my opinion, what you can do is you can use sidebars to help push up the specific nature of your article. So in the right rail of your website, you can actually go and, and list things in nice lists or tag clouds or with images that are, help your article be a lot more specific. You can use pull quote boxes to do the same. More on that later. Pictures and inline graphics. Let me give you an example from my website. If you actually type in ad sales training, you're going to notice that my website pops up number one on Google. With this particular article, and in regards to my IT sales training business, I also teach people in the software business, I wanted this article to be found for IT sales training. So when someone would go search for IT sales training, 
this particular page would be found. So one of the things I did is I actually did a pull quote. I pulled that quote and put it in the middle of the page. You'll see it here in red and in quotes. It's in bold and it's an H1 tag, which don't cancel each other out. Monthly IT sales training is big and it's in the middle. You'll also notice that I've mentioned IT sales training six or eight times in this article in an honest and ethical way. Now, is there a correct percentage or is there a number that I can give to you? I don't have that information to provide to you, so I can only provide to you what I've observed in terms of a best practice. First of all, I try to write it, any article, so that it's very readable by the general public. I don't want to write it for Google. I want to write it so it's correct for the public, meaning that I don't want to litter the article with IT sales training, just as an example. I want to do it in an honest and ethical way. And I have found when you do that, Google rewards you. As an example, when we go look here at this particular article again from the Boston Herald, the word Red Sox is mentioned, you know, two or three times. What they may have been able to do to improve their rankings for this particular story within the Google index is rather than it saying ALCS Game 3, which is an acronym that only baseball people know, they might have been able to say, as an example, Red Sox pitcher Verlander, as an example, um, had a strong start at AL ALCS game number three, just as an example. Now, obviously, there's hundreds of examples that we can give, but in my opinion, the more specific you are, the better Google is going to rank you. Now, why throughout this webinar do I keep saying, in my opinion? I, I want you to be really clear on something. I don't have a direct connect to Google. What I do is I read a lot of blogs from Google ears, read a lot of articles, and what I do is I test and I use myself as a guinea pig. So that way you don't have to be a guinea pig, okay? Number three, videos and photos that back up your articles. I believe that Google really likes that. You want to know why? Because Google ears are people too. They're people just like you and I. And one of the things I think that most people like is videos and photos that back up your articles. Now, I've noticed that Google tends to rank articles better with two or more properly tagged photos. So that means that you're going to fill out the alt tag on a photo through your content management system. And then you're also going to name the photo correctly. So in the CMS, you want to use the alt tag. and You'll find that when you click on the picture or use your WYSIWYG editor. And then the file name needs to make sense rather than it just being a random number that is generated by your camera. You may actually want to say using the cookie example, Call the picture cookie recipe 1221 or whatever it is, rather than just a random number assigned by your camera. So it does take a little bit of effort, but I have found that if you do this, okay, and you do it honestly and ethically, that Google really likes it. The other piece is, I think your readers will really like it as well. Number four of the top 10 things that I think Google likes, I think they love it when people link to you. And it's been proven over the course of time because I have a syndication plan for the blogs that I write. I want people to share my content and I want people to link to me. So those of you that are media companies watching this video today, I think it's important for you to understand that you need to live outside of your silo. I think it's important for all of us to understand that we can use RSS, which stands for really simple syndication. We can also use companies, uh, whether it's Vocus or whoever you might choose, PR Web that's going to send out your articles to a mass audience and they potentially are going to link back to you. You can also create widgets. Okay, There's a lot of uh, free widget creators out there. Google has several that allow you to share your news, your press releases, and it allows you to pass this on to different organizations and schools and things like that. You want to really create a strategic plan for creating really good, solid partnerships with others within your community. As an example, let's say that you're a parenting magazine and you're on this webinar today and you think to yourself, wow, it'd really be cool if the local elementary school would share our articles on their website. Well, create a widget for that. Go to Google and search for free RSS widgets or content sharing widgets. Okay. So for me, do you create content with linking as a goal inside of the content you create? that you're going to syndicate out and share with others, schools, people across the country? Do you actually put links within that content back over to you? 
I do this all the time. I have a syndication plan in place. And I want you to consider that as well because I have seen over the course of the last, oh, a lot of years, <laughs> I've really seen that Google likes that. They like it when people link to you as well as when you syndicate your content. I'm going to talk more about linking here in just a second as we move on to number five. I believe that Google loves it when people share your information, when they share about you on Twitter and on Facebook. So did you know that when you post on Facebook, only one to 3% of the people that like your page actually see it? Now, obviously that number can change dramatically just based upon the number of people that engage with your content, the number of people that share with your content. So ask yourself this, is what you're posting worth paying to promote? Okay, if it's not, then you might want to stop. If you want all of the people that like your media company's page to see the post that you place on Facebook, more than likely, you're going to have to pay to promote it. So to that end, would someone want to share it? Ask yourself that before you link to an article on your website, would someone want to share it? Now, to that point about linking, I think, I think Google loves it when they see people linking to you from Twitter and from Facebook. So how do you encourage that? You encourage that by putting your information in, in, front, in front of as many people as possible. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about people engaging with your content, people doing cool things with your content. And that's why I think pictures are critical. One of the things I've noticed, and I believe that Facebook would, would back me up on this, is that you're going to see clicks and shares increase by as much as 15 to 20% when you actually add a picture to what it is that you post on Twitter, on Facebook, and definitely on Pinterest because it's all driven by that. So consider that when you're sharing your content and if you want people to share your stuff all across Facebook and Twitter, you want to make sure you have pictures and also don't forget, you're probably going to have to pay to promote your post. Now, because this is a point of confusion, let me, let me repeat it briefly one more time. Many of you as magazines, newspapers, radio stations, etc., you have a Facebook page. Let's just say on that Facebook page, 5,000 people have liked it or become a fan or a friend of your page. When you place an update on your Facebook page, only 1% to 3% typically of your fans are going to see it. If you want everyone to see it, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to pay to promote it. Let's not be mad about that. Let's understand that what Facebook actually loves, okay, is they love to help you. They love to drive engagement. Now, if you don't want to pay for it, okay, which is a shortcut, then what you need to do is create posts that people heavily engage with. I actually have some business owners that I work with that when they post on their wall, it gets shared a lot, 25, 35% of their people. Why is that? It's because Facebook rewards you. Facebook rewards you. When people share your content. Let's talk about Google Plus for a second. We don't want to leave out Google Plus. I have found that when I share my content on Google Plus, the articles that I share links to actually rank better within the Google index. I truly believe that Google rewards you for writing great content and for sharing that content. All right, let's keep moving forward. Number six of 10. Google loves it when you tell them where to look on your website. I, it, I'm amazed at the number of publishers that I work with, that when I drill into their website, they actually don't have a site map to guide the Googlebot through their website. It's vividly important. Now, again, some opinions from me, but I back it up with some good research. I like to have an XML site map that's immediately available through the robots.txt file. All of you should have a robots.txt file, and robots.txt file guides the Googlebot, tells it where to go. Now, my understanding is that uh, Google is going to find it there. But the other thing is you want to make sure that your website is listed within your Google Webmaster tool set. Very simple to do. I find that Google makes it easy for me to be a success online. It's one of the reasons that I truly love Google and what they do for the business community, especially those of us that are in the media business. Within your Google Webmaster tools, make sure that your XML sitemap or your sitemap is, is listed. Now, some of you confuse a sitemap with an index. A lot of you believe that the navigation alone is going to guide Google through your website. Well, let's be straight here with you. The Googlebot is pretty darn smart, and the folks at Google are pretty darn smart for creating it. 
But what I have found is if I give them a roadmap, I will always, almost always index better. It goes back to one of the things I said earlier on in our conversation today. And one of the main things that I hear Matt Cuts talk about all the time in all of his webinars and blogs and conversations and hearing him at conferences. If you create a great website that has a ton of reader benefit, you follow some of these guidelines, you're always going to rank better than those that are trying to beat the system. Quit trying to beat the Google bot. You don't need to. Help the Google bot. Help it and you're going to be rewarded. Now, one last thing, point number three here. Your navigation really needs to reflect your keywords. And the reason I think that's important is because if you look at most listings uh, within Google, okay, if you look at the navigation here, again, using the Boston Herald as, a, as an example, the navigation is very generic. And what I would actually encourage them to do is create navigation and internal pieces, okay, of their website. So right now we're on the main page. Now we're going to drill into sports. In my opinion, some ways that they could actually enhance this is they really should, this really should say uh, Boston sports um, rather than just Patriots. We really want to be specific to Boston sports as an example. It's just a, a small example. There's a lot of other things that we could potentially do. Make sure your navigation reflects your content and is not generic. All right, moving on to tip number seven of 10. I believe that Google loves it when your articles are obvious and they're keyword dense. Let's talk about that a little bit. Keyword specificity or specificity, okay, is important, but also the density of the keywords within your article is important. Now, one of the tools that I like to use to gauge how dense my article is, meaning how many occurrences of a keyword phrase or phrases, is I like to use this tool from seobook.com. You'll find it at the top of your screen there, tools.seobook.com forward slash general, forward slash keyword dash density. And if you pause this video, you can just see it right there at the top of your screen. Then what you do is you're actually going to put the URL of your website or of the web page you're working on in the box there below, and you're going to click submit. Then what it's going to do is it's going to actually give you back analysis of that keyword. So as an example, let's go over to the Detroit Free Press. Uh, since we're kind of having a World Series theme going on here. Let's go ahead and punch this URL into the keyword density checker. What's going to tell us when you look at the summary is all the keywords that the robot is finding, the meta description. Now, let me be clear, the keyword density analyzer is not a part of, of Google, and I don't believe they're, they're owned by Google. Maybe someday they will be. But it's going to tell us the one word, two word, and three word phrases that a robot is seeing within that particular page on your website. Look carefully, you'll notice there's 28 counts of Detroit Tigers on the page for a density of 1.08%. There's a 27 word count for Red Wings, 24 for Red Sox at a 0.93% density. There's also some random things that are appearing here that we might want to fix. The nice thing about this tool is it allows you to see what a robot sees and removes the human perspective from the analysis. Now, to this end, if they wanted to be found for Detroit Tigers, it looks to me that they're doing a pretty good job with that. But the other piece is, they're only at about a 1.08% density. Now, let me be clear about my opinion here. I believe if you go over about 5%, you're going to tilt the machine. You're going to tilt Google. Now, I don't have that on good authority from Google, just based on my past background. I try to keep my keyword density somewhere between 2 and 3% because I want to make sure it's readable by a human being as well as it's being analyzed well by a robot. So use this tool and check out some of the pages on your website to see how keyword dense your pages are. My experience leads me to share this with you. Keyword dense articles okay, that are keyword rich, that are really relevant, that have clear titles and headlines always rank better over those that are generic or trying to cast a really wide net. All right? Number eight of 10, when you use H1 tags and or blocks or pull quotes, I have found you're always going to have better success with the Googlebot. Here's an example of my WYSIWYG editor within uh, WordPress or within Joomla maybe or Drupal. And you'll notice that there's typically a drop-down box where you can actually choose what you want this word to be. 
What is an H1 tag? An H1 tag is good old fashioned HTML for this is a heading or this is a title or more importantly, this is important. Now, some of you might think, well, Ryan, how about if we just make everything an H1 tag? You know, it's the old example of sometimes people will say, well, if the most searched term on Google is Paris Hilton, why don't I put Paris Hilton on every single page of my website? Come on, guys. You don't think Google can figure that out? Okay, that Google bot is pretty darn smart. It's going to see right through that. Remember something. The day you quit trying to beat Google, okay, is the day that you're going to start seeing some results. And I mean that. Again, let me say it one more time. The day that you quit trying to beat Google is the day that you're going to see results. You'll notice that everything I'm talking about is not about beating the Google bot. More along the lines, what it really is, is about you feeding the bot in a way that's, ethic, that's ethical, in a way that's efficient, in a way that's going to get you some good rewards. So check it out within your WYSIWYG editor. Number nine of 10, Google loves it when your titles and headlines make a ton of sense. Now, the example that I gave you at the beginning really, really of this webinar really applies here. And I think it's important that you remember, again, that Google is a robot. You need to treat it as a robot. You need to feed it things that are specific. Again, Google doesn't do clever, okay? meaning Google, the Googlebot doesn't do jokes. It doesn't understand pithy or, or, or clever headlines. And then finally, number 10, I have found that Google likes it when you use bold. Again, you know, can you go, can you go crazy with it? Yeah, but it's going to tilt the pinball machine. Stop. Stop doing that. Bold shows you care. It shows that that is something that's important. Keep in mind, there is a tipping point. So don't make the whole article bold and don't go crazy with it. Google's going to look for patterns. I know they do. Okay, because I know the Google bot is smart. Number four, do you have a plan in place so that people don't get bold happy within your organization? Remember, SEO is really a top-down, a top-down situation. It's going to start from the senior editor and work all the way down through these media company websites. All right, let's review Google top 10 SEO things that I believe that Google likes. Number one, they love keyword-rich articles. But don't go crazy. Just be specific, which leads to number two. Be very specific. If your article is about kids and cookies, make sure it's very clear in everything you do. Number three, I believe that Google likes articles with videos and pictures. My experience tells me the more the merrier when it comes to that. Google loves it when people link to you, so have a syndication plan and encourage people to link to you through widgets and RSS feeds and things like that. Share a lot on Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus because Google loves it when your content is good and shared online. Number six, Google loves it when you tell them where to look. So make sure that you have a really good quality sitemap in place. And don't forget about putting that sitemap in your Google Webmaster Tools. Number seven, Google loves it when your articles are obvious and keyword dense. So make sure you use that tool to figure out the difference. You've got keyword specific articles, and then you want to make sure your density in that article is good and not too much. Number eight, use H1 tags where appropriate and bold. And until somebody tells me different, I think that, that Google likes it. Number nine, I know that Google likes it when your titles and your headlines make sense. So be careful of those clevy, clever or pithy headlines. And then number 10, don't get bold happy, but use bold when it makes sense because bold really shows that you care about the article or the words that you're, that you're highlighting. You know, guys, I really think that great SEO is something that can be achieved. I think it's something that is important to all of us as media companies. Take your time to review this a video with your staff. And as always, I thank you so much for being a part of the Shweki Booster webinars. My name is Ryan Dorn from Brainswell Media and also 360 Ad Sales Training and Strategy. I'd love to meet with your team about this topic. All Shweki customers are entitled to a 25% discount off my services. I'd love to get on the phone with you for a, th a free 30-minute consultation. Until next time, on behalf of the Shweki Media team, we'll see you down the road to great SEO success.